Good morning. After a record-breaking stretch of rain in New Mexico, this is more rain than since I've been here uh, for continuous days, there's flooding all over. Uh, there is there, there's water in Chaco Canyon. It's actually running. That's unheard of. Uh, we were there uh, with my good friend uh, Richard Muller uh, a couple of weekends ago, and there was water in uh, the creek there. Uh, I spoke to someone who was there over the weekend, and they said it was a torrent uh, at that time during the weekend. So this is, uh, this is unprecedented. And being from the Northeast, I never thought I'd see the day I would be praying for rain. Uh, and I'm back in that mode where I remember now, I remember why I left the Northeast, because <coughs> they've been too soggy. And especially in an in a environment that's not really adept at handling um, excess water. We uh, are going to have uh, Richard talking to you today about, this is in essence an introduction to digital uh, photography. And he's going to talk about the various uh, uh, formats that are available, various kinds of cameras. He'll be uh, giving you tips on if you're looking to buy a digital camera, what you need to be uh, looking at. And he'll show you some examples of the, of the potential for printing uh, from digital format. Uh, this is all material you can anticipate appearing on a quiz. So I strongly suggest when you're talking about uh, sensors, megapixels, uh, and the like that you pay attention. And why this is so important too is that as we're talking about when you're curating uh, digital information, that you have what you have encoded in the various uh, formats, whether it be a tagged image file format, TIFF, or a JPEG, uh, or a GIF file, uh, but you also need to be aware that if you are creating hard copy of uh, the various images for an exhibition, uh, and you want this uh, hard copy to have a longevity, there are certain considerations you need to uh, think about. So that's also what uh, Richard's gonna be talking about today. So Richard, thanks for coming today. See 
that this is a problem for you folks because I, you know, I produced probably a hundred of these kind of discs through the many years I've worked in. And they're all sitting in the, in the file cabinets of archaeologists and in the various park headquarters. But these are deteriorating. They're not going to last forever. And up on the hill there is a big museum, you know, the, uh, the uh, archaeological museum up on the hill. Um, they store digital, they store regular photographs, but they have real problems storing this kind of material for posterity because you really got to recopy it every 10 years, five years, I don't know what the standards are. The other thing is that uh, in time, um, video photography has progressed. And one of the reasons I had to go from, you know, from one megapixel up to 20 megapixels is because the archaeologists using this material, and that would be something for you to consider too, is that when you store material, if you store it in low resolution, it limits its use. The archaeologists were complaining that when they write their papers and use their photographs, if they try to crop a small element out of the photograph, it doesn't have a resolution. So the one megapixel cameras were great, and two megapixels were great. For example, this photograph right here is taken with a two megapixel camera. You know, and taken big, it's fine. But if you if you wanted to crop just this little area right here and put it into a paper, the publication, it wouldn't look very good. So that's why I was pressured to go to more and more megapixels, only because the end use was to crop the uh, the photographs. So at this point in time, cameras are really got to be very, very good. You know, I look in the paper, it's, it's Sunday, you know, this is just in the newspaper with all these cameras. I notice you all have cameras there too. Almost every camera you buy today from a, a reputable manufacturer is really for the picture pictures. If you take it in sunlight, even on our Mac, they're going to be really quite good. However, it's when you start getting in situations where the lighting is tricky or you have to do special things, that's when it's good to know a little bit more about the cameras. And that's one of the things that I wanted to point out to you. Through the years, I've purchased cameras all, I got them all on eBay, always after the next generation has come in, so they are cheap. So all my cameras I've never paid more than $200 for. So this was the very first one. And then as time went on, this one right here uh, is the one that my wife uses. It's a 3 megapixel camera. Each of these have different features. And it, uh, I'll get into the features which distinguish the cameras these days, one from the other. So that was a 3 megapixel. And then went up to an 8 megapixel camera. Again, remember all of these cameras, if you, if you know what you're buying, and you can get it on a you are going to pay less than $200 for a very good camera. So all of these pictures have been taken with, uh, with those kind of cameras. And eventually you work your way up to a single red lens reflex, which is, I think, probably what you got here, right? Are these? Anyway, I don't know what you're going to see when you're in the bag. But at the end of this camera, you'll find your meat and you'll know what you have. But you can see this camera is heavy. It's big, and there are reasons for it, and there are reasons why I don't like to use it sometimes. So, anyway, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a handout here. And I'm going to talk about some of the. Uh,
If anyone has any questions along the way at any point, please just, just ask. Um, I think one of the first things I wanted to do is just describe how a digital camera works, and that will then help you understand why some of these features exist in different cameras. Let's start with the lens. We all know that every, well, by the way, all of these cameras I have here are all similar in what I'm describing about. Every digital camera, every, every uh, iPhone, every your digital phones, all the cameras in them, and they all have the basic elements of what we're describing. Uh, we have big lenses like this, and they catch a lot of light. And then, I'll show you something really pretty amazing. One of my hobbies is flying way on short gliders. And sometimes I put a camera on the glider just in front of it. And this is a camera right here. And they sell it for 25 bucks off of Amazon. But they take beautiful video cameras. If you look at your iPods, See, there's a little lens on there. So, so the lens can vary, but they all basically do the same job. They, they capture light. The bigger the lens, the more light it captures, and the lower light level you can operate in. So we start off with the lens, and light comes through the lens and falls onto an image sensor. And this thing here, this is the, this is that captures the digital information. This is a pretty amazing device, and I just I'm going to draw a little picture here to, to explain how they work. Imagine you have a piece of silicone, silicon, which has many many sites which are sensitive to light. So when light falls on this sensor, each one of these little sites senses the intensity of the light. And what's amazing is that engineers have been able to work out what they do is they want to get this right. They actually put on the on each of these sensors a little filter. This one filters green light. This one's red. This is green, this is red, and then the next row is blue, green, blue, green, and then it goes on green, red, green, red, etc., etc. When you talk about a 20 megapixel sensor, that little piece of silicon has 20 million of these little sites, and each one of them has a different colored filter over it. That's pretty amazing. So anyway, um, then what happens is the light falls on here and all the green photons fall into the green areas. The reds go there, the green goes there. And now what you have attached to this by a, a, a wire is an image processor. It's really a computer. Every one of your cameras has a little computer. Even this little thing right here has a little computer. Because what it's doing is it's looking at each one of these little sites and capturing how much green is in this one, how much red in this one, how much blue in this one and collecting all that information and turning it into an image. Yes? Is it like a man-made rainbow? Yes, it is. I mean, I'm, in a way, what they're doing, what it's doing is capturing colors of the rainbow. It's only capturing green, red, and blue. But, but it's, it's, it's separating. These filters are doing exactly that. Yes. And um, and these sensors, the, the, the most expensive cameras, have a sensor 
which is exactly the size of the color slide that I had here somewhere. That's a, let's call it two by two slide. This is the size, that black area, of a, what they call a full frame sensor. Because of the, the legacy of, of you know, color photography, this became the standard. And so when they decided to make cameras digital, they began making it with this format in mind. So if you buy the, one of the upscale large cameras these days, it'll have a full frame sensor like this. They're very expensive, but they have one advantage is that the bigger the bigger the sensor uh, area is, the bigger this little green rectangle is, the, the more photons it can capture. And so therefore, if you have a tiny camera like, like this, with eight megapixels, each of these little areas are tiny, 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 where on, with a full frame sensor, the same area would be very large, which means that the bigger this area is, the more photons it can collect and the, the better the image is going to be. Now, if you look at this original camera that I had, this two megapixel camera right here, it takes gorgeous pictures. Like this is taking one right here, this camera. And it has only two million as opposed to 20 million. And the reason you can take gorgeous pictures is because the, 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 sens the sensors are far apart and the technology says that the farther apart they are, the, the bigger they are, the better they are. So it, when, you, when you look at a sensor in a camera, the fact that you say you have 20 million, uh, 20 million sites doesn't necessarily make the camera better. In some cases it makes the camera worse because they've packed these things so close together that the imagery may not be as good as a 10 megapixel camera where these things are farther apart. So the, the advertising these days claim, you know, the higher the megapixels, the better the camera. That is not true. You know, a good three megapixel camera can take fantastic pictures as long as you don't want to do a lot of cropping. You know, and uh, so I guess that's one point I'd like to make, is that when you, uh, are, when you look at the size of the image uh, that you're buying, don't always think that there are more megapixels other than that. So we have the image processor, and then we, this moves on to a display. And the back of each camera is a display. And there are many, many kinds of displays, but almost all digital cameras have, you know, something in the back, right? So you can see your imagery. And some cameras, the image processor sends a signal out to an electronic viewfinder, an electronic viewfinder, Where, you, where with your eye, you can look in and you can actually see what's on your display. And then there are other cameras which put a mirror right here and they send the, the, uh, the incoming light to another little mirror and then there's a tiny little lens here and then you can look through the camera like this and you can see the image. And when you press the button to take the picture, this mirror flips out of the way so that the image can go to the sensor. Does that make sense? You see how that works? That's called a single lens reflex, SLR. So a single lens reflex has this mechanism right here. And that's what this camera is. And that's why it's so big and bulky is because you've got all the mechanism needed to 
break the, the, the line of, of uh, uh, the optical line here. So that temporarily you're looking through your camera as though it were a telescope. And then when you press the button, you hear this big clack. The, 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 cam the mirror goes up. The signal goes straight through. This, the light goes straight through to your sensor, then onto your image processor. And now, some cameras, uh, like this one does, has what's called live view, where when you go into live view mode, the, the, uh, this, this mirror flips up. It goes through, and you can see it on the back of your camera like a, on a display. So then what, you all, what the image processor also does is sends out the, uh, the image to a storage device. I'll call it, the, the common one now is an SDR, SD card. That's your storage device. And what the mid image processor also has something hooked to it, which is the battery. So that's how a digital camera works. And in order to distinguish themselves, one camera manufacturer from another, they play games right here in the image processor. They do all kinds of things. You know, for example, there's something that, that's now quite popular called face recognition. That if you set the image processor up to do recognizing of faces, it will, when you take a picture, it will focus in on the face and set a good exposure just for the face. Uh, not everybody needs that. I've never used it, but that's just one of the features. Because this is a computer, just like you have here, so many things are possible. And so what's happening is that manufacturers are just more and more thinking of new ways to add features here to make you buy their camera as opposed to other cameras. But the basics here are the same for all cameras. And what's happening is that more and more, there's an article in this, uh, there are a lot of magazines that get interested in going into photography, photography which are constantly predicting that it won't be long before this trend right here, the SLR, will no longer be uh, popular. That you're going to get very high quality electronic viewfinders. Your display capabilities are just going up. You look at the latest iPhones, or some of those displays are just fantastic. And um, And basically what you're going to end up with is a camera that is going to be much lighter and smaller because you don't have to have all of this single lens reflex uh, hardware and plus it will be a lot more reliable. So with all of this in mind, what I'd like to do is just go through some of the, the features that this image processor provides that might help you decide what you yourself might need for the particular job you want to do. Oh, and by the way, of course, what you have around here, around this whole thing, is the case that encloses all of this. And, it, and the case itself becomes a very important part of the camera because some cameras are completely sealed, like this very first one. The only thing you couldn't get any dust into this one if you tried. Yet many cameras, like the uh, like these single lens reflex cameras, you take the lens off and you can just load your camera off the dirt. And since I'm working with the National Park Service, out in the field, when you get dust rolling, you know, like sand and, and dirt, it can very easily ruin your camera. So I've tried, that's why I never use this one in the field, just because of the quickly deteriorate. But you also find is that the little cameras like well, many cameras have the uh, lenses that, that you know that 
pull in and out. Grit gets in there. And if you have dirt, it jams up. Some have little automatic windows that open and close. Dirt gets in there, they stay open, or they stay closed. So these are all the different features that relate to the overall case of the, of the camera. So let's quickly go down the list here. And again, if you have any questions, Uh, the side, what, what may or may not be important to you is size. For me, size is very important. I don't want to carry around a very heavy camera in the field all the time. But if you're in a studio photography, or if you're in, you know, in a museum doing curatorship type work, it doesn't make any difference. But size and weight are, uh, are major, major factors. And because cameras are going more to the straight digital camera without these single lens reflex, uh, the, the overall size and the weight of the cameras are going down. Battery light is another issue. Um, all of these cameras use batteries of various sorts. They all tend to be um, proprietary batteries. So what happens is you can open up the so here, here is a, a battery for this camera. It costs about $35. That lasts about two years. And after about four years, you're not going to be able to buy it anymore because the manufacturer has gone on to others. And all you can buy are second party batteries. And they're not as good. So anyway, batteries are an issue. What I have what I like best of all in my work are batteries that are this is the this is the camera I use most of all. change back and forth, plus these batteries, uh, they're nickel metal hydride batteries, rechargeable, you can use them a thousand times or more, and the capacity of these batteries is fantastic, it's much larger than any of the others. So I don't know why manufacturers don't use more of the, the ordinary e-cells, but some do, so if you're, if you're shopping for a camera, and you don't want to have to worry about batteries for the rest of your life, and the way to do it is to get this. And by the way, if, you, if you're interested in, in rechargeable batteries, these are available from Amazon. They're called Enemy, E-M-E-L-O-P. You get uh, eight of them for 20 bucks. And I use them in everything, flashlights, and GPS, and whatever. So anyway, there, there are battery choices, but my choice is to go with ordinary A cells just because it's a lot cheaper. Okay, the display screen, um, that varies with many cameras, but around here, if you have a camera that has only a display screen but no electronic viewfinder, it's hard to see the image in the sunlight. Have you noticed that with your own camera? You just can't, can't see anything. And, um, so that is why the electronic viewfinder is so good, because no matter how bright it is, if you've got a good electronic viewfinder, you see everything that's on your display. And the other advantage is that you, you see exactly what you're going to get. You can, you can, when you look at the camera, once you get used to it, you know that what you see is what you're going to get when you push that button. With a single lens reflex, you don't see what you're going to get because you see what, what's coming through the lens, but then this thing flips up and goes to the sensor, and you can only see what you've gotten afterwards. And if it's a bright day, and you don't have an electronic viewfinder, you can take a picture with a single lens reflex, and you're out there in the sunlight trying to see whether you got a good picture or not. Does that make sense? Yeah.
So anyway, and the other, uh, what's nice with some displays is that they rotate. See that rotate? These are all these features I'm telling you about the camera manufacturers uh, use to distinguish themselves. But with a, with a, with a, uh, a rotating lens like this, you can hold it up and take a picture like this. You can see the image if it's not too sunny. Or you can go right down on the ground and shoot up. And so if I'm shooting, for example, into a, a granary or something in the, in the site, I can put the camera in and I can adjust my camera and see what I'm doing you know, with my, at arm's length. So, um, and of course, the bigger the screens, the, the nicer they are, but they also are more damn more prone to damage, especially if they're very close to the edge of the frames. I've seen quite a few cameras where someone will drop the camera and it crack the screen because it's so big. But anyway, <coughs> most cameras have, are getting better and better screens these days. Um, the live viewfinder we've talked about. Um, and this is my, I, I like the live viewfinder the best just because you can see what you're going to get when you get it. However, when it comes to focusing, it, the single lens reflex is better because it's so bright and clear. Okay, dust and moisture existence. This camera right here, for example, is a has a, uh, a 15x uh, zoom lens, and zoom lenses do this. You know, they go in and out like this to get a zoom, and dirt gets in there. And then you, you know, it goes in and out. So what, if it's important to you, as it is to me, having a sealed camera, which the zoom all takes place inside here. And, um, and it's completely sealed from the environment. Interchangeable lenses. Um, most single lens reflexes these days have interchangeable lenses like this one. You can buy different lenses to do different work. If you're taking portraits, you can get lenses that are optimized for that. If you're doing macro photography, they're optimized for that, you can just interchange them. And that may or may not be important to you. For me, I like to have everything built into one camera so I don't have to change lenses. But the optical quality is a little bit less than if you use interchangeable lenses. But as I said before, the optical quality of these of these cameras is just getting to be so good that unless you're really a professional photographer looking for that last two percent, um, these are really very good. I mean, uh, this little camera right here, you know, which again was hundred dollars, you know, the news on the people has light lenses. Something else that cameras have, and I don't know whether your cameras you have had it, they're called image stabilizers. As you get zoom lenses, camera shape becomes an issue. We have noticed when you uh, take a, you are using a binoculars, you know, you shake your hand, shake the binoculars, image shapes. Most of these new cameras come out with an image stabilizer, and that's all part of this image processor business. They have little gyroscopes in there you know, and, and sensors that basically um, allow you to take pictures even if you have camera shape and they come out very well. But there are situations where you don't want to have it so you have to you, you turn it off if you don't need it. <coughs> By the way, all of these cameras come with instruction books that are 70, 80 pages. They are, they are very, very uh, complicated in ways. However, they all have an automatic feature where you can just put it on automatic and let the camera make all the decisions and probably 80% of your pictures will be fine. It's that last 20% where you need to do it. We talked a little bit about lens quality. Macro, um, 
some cameras are very good at taking macro photographs, very close photographs. This camera right here, this little one, and my, and my, my, why my wife so loves using it, is because it's so easy to take super macro photographs. You can get right up and touch the beetle's nose, and it'll, it'll be perfectly shot. Yet my favorite camera, this one, has a very poor macro capability. By the time I get into macro, I can go through all kinds of settings. Uh, the beam is moved. <laughs> so, um, what I'm trying to point out is that what, you have to decide what's important to you and try to find a camera that has that in it. So that's macro. Panorama support. Of all these cameras, this one, has the ability to help you make super panoramas. Um, when you take a picture, it remembers the picture you took, so as you move the camera to the next position, the panorama means taking a, a large, a many pictures and stitching them together to get a beautiful long image. It basically allows you to, uh, to align your next image with the one you took before. You see a ghost of the image you took, and then it lines it. Plus, it then organizes all the pictures on your card so that when you go to stitch it, they're all organized by a panorama. I don't know if any of you ever tried panoramas, but um, if you just go ahead and take a panorama zoom, bing, 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 and then you go and take a lot of other pictures and snapshots and whatnot, you have to figure out which pictures did you, ever, did you take for the panorama. This camera figures that all out. So on the last uh, project that was on Utah, I think I had just finished processing about 30 panoramas. Because in many of the sites that we were working in, it's, it's so much easier to understand if you have a full view of everything going on. So panorama support, if that's important to you, some cameras give it to you, some don't. Uh, manual focus. Um, these cameras always auto give you automatic focus. However, there are situations where if you're taking sunsets where at times the, the, uh, the image is not sharply defined and the camera refuses to focus. <coughs> I mean, you may have run into that yourself. But, so having a manual focus capability to open in, in situations where the automatic doesn't work and that happens with all these cameras in some cases, it just doesn't work, um, is a thing that might be important to you. So. High dynamic, dynamic range processing. I don't know if you've taken pictures with your cameras here and notice if, if you're taking pictures that have a very bright part and a very dark part, the, the white, the bright turns white and the dark turns black. But your eye, you still see a wide range of color, you know, a wide range of uh, uh, brilliance. So some of these cameras now have the capability, when you take a picture, it actually takes three pictures, or sometimes more. And the image processor takes all the ones that were overexposed, and takes the good parts of that, this one takes the ones that underexposed, the good parts of that puts them all together and gives you a much better image quality than you would get by just taking a single picture. And that's called HDR. This, I have one camera here that does that. This camera right here is a, is a camera that a friend of mine has. And so I'm going to keep it up here. He makes a, he makes a good living shooting photographs and uh, sunlight. And this is the camera that he uses. And it has uh, this HDR capability. Taking three pictures and quickly stitching and giving you a much wider dynamic range. The whites aren't washed out and the blacks aren't black. That's easy. Uh, almost all these uh, cameras will take movies, and nowadays more and more videos are being shot using actually single and three frames cameras that were built in movie camera. So, 
And then I'll get into the last thing, which is really ease of control. And that is how you basically make adjustments to your cameras to get a, to get a better picture. Now, the very beginning cameras that we had here, they were pretty much automatic. You just snapshots, just basically turn the camera on to take the picture. But as you begin working with it, you're going to want to be able to, able to adjust your white balance. For example, if I take a picture in this room with this camera, it'll come out yellow because it has fluorescent lights. It's designed for sun for sunlight. So what you want to be able to do is change the white balance to say I'm taking pictures of the sunlight, I'm taking pictures you know, with an incandescent ball or fluorescent, whatever. Because the light color is different from each light source. And cameras that have only a screen in back for making those decisions become very difficult because you have to you have to be able to bring up the menu, you have to scroll down to white balance, you have to press a button, and if it's sunlight, you can't see what you're doing. So what some, some camera manufacturers do is they put knobs on top, which you can just rotate. So, you can rotate. so if I want to take, if I want to have a specific setting, I can just quickly go to it. And, and uh, uh, instead of having to scroll down a, a, a video screen, You're also, if, if you're interested, for example, in uh, taking very low light of photography, you may want to open the lens all the way up, where the automatic camera may not suggest that you may want to open it all the way up. That's, you want to be able to adjust aperture, you want to be able to adjust the shutter speed. If you're taking pictures of things that are moving, you, know, you want to go a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second. Uh, there's one feature that I like very much, but it only exists in one of these cameras that I have, and that is exposure on. This is, if you're taking a picture of a chopper, you have a beautiful window, with a beautiful scene out through this window, but you're in a room. If you want what's outside the window to be perfectly exposed, what you want to do is zoom in on that that area, and that's a separate exposure, and then draw back and compose your picture. Well, this, this particular camera allows you to lock that exposure in and then do whatever you want to do with creating your picture. There is something called spot metering where you can adjust, you set your camera so that it will, it has a tiny little spot that it will meter on which you can put out that window. However, some spots are so big that it doesn't work very well. But sometimes it does work very well. So anyway, being able to make those adjustments is very, very important. The other thing you want, you're going to want to change periodically is the sensitivity of the camera. When the, when the photons fall into this sensor, the image processor counts them. And if there are lots and lots of photons, then you get a very, very good uh, picture free of noise. Do you know the word noise? If you, look at, if you look at some of the images that you might take at night, they're very grainy. That's because there are very few photons in these various wells. And this image processor is, is making some assumptions cranking up its, it, you know, it's trying to read them and make some decisions, but they come out very, very, very grainy. So what's important is to uh, be able to make the adjustments so that you can, uh, uh, so that you can get non-grainy pictures. And that adjustment is called ISO, and every camera has a different way of doing it. And I saw the 100, for example, which goes back to film technology, is, is, a, is a very high quality image. But you can't shoot very much in the dark. ISO 1200 is, is shooting very much in the dark. It cranks up the sensitivity of your image processor. Some cameras, like the reason I bought this camera 
is because it's very good in low light. I can take pictures of the stars, or of these other cameras, I can't. And that's because it has a good ISO capability, where these other cameras do not. Um, flash strengths, if you're taking pictures up close to somebody, you can, you can adjust the picture so the flash isn't as strong as if you're going to take a picture all the way across the room. So these are all the adjustments that are possible because of this image processing. It's just like a, it's a computer program. And these yes. I have a question. This. I photographed previously that dog. Yeah. Basketball You're going to, you can, with e the image processor allows you to process images which are more or less compressed. The image processor basically compresses the image into JPEGs or chips. So you're familiar with that when you report to with the, the format. Many people now are, are shooting in RAW. So basically, everything that comes out of this sensor goes straight to the SD card. That's why the files are so big. The raw image is basically recording the actual readings for each one of these little sensors. And then you have to use Photoshop to, to do what this processor does in turning your images into JPEGs. So uh, uh, there's, there's so much data available and the image processor basically has to decide how much of it is it, is it going to throw away and how much is it going to keep. So for example, a JPEG will say, well, here, here's, a, here's a red spot in my photograph, and here are a bunch of other red spots. So therefore, this whole area is red. It's you know, one, one reading. Where with RAW, it, it, it's recording every single green, red, green, red, blue spot, and then you have to use Photoshop to do the process. I don't have the time to do that, but more and more people are doing it because you can, you can basically forget a lot of the, it, the things about white balance, for example, when you shoot raw because you, you, you solve, you deal with that problem when you're in Photoshop. But I'm living with JPEGs and it's just fine. And then there are a whole bunch of other settings which, which cameras have, they're called scene settings. Uh, if you're going to shoot fireworks, you just click on the scene and bingo, it, it sets the camera up for idea for that. And some have sunsets, beach, and snow. It basically is, is adjusting all of the parameters to optimize the picture for that. And some cameras have this right up on the wheel, like this one does. Other cameras don't. You have to read it off the back of your screen. But basically, that is probably more than you want to know about visual cameras. And before I move into printing, 
we should go very quickly. Um, maybe you can, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Well, the word, they, they use the word megapixel. So an eight megapixel camera has eight million sites. A 20 megapixel camera has 20 million sites. Yeah, there are 20 million photoreceptors, each one with a little filter over it. Oh, oh no, no, they haven't done that. That's how many of those in the eyes. Is that right? Wow. Well, Tony, it's getting close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me quickly move on to printing because that is a little simpler. Okay, in printing. Number one is your ink supply. And that's connected to ink jets. And um, controlling the ink jets, I'm just going to call it a, a jet controller, okay? It's another computer. And what happens is that this controller will tell an inkjet to squirt a certain amount of ink. And um, this is a cartridge. This is a cartridge for a printer. I mean, how many do you have printers that could be able to work with? Okay, well, some cartridges have three or four in one. So if you buy the Hewlett Packard cartridges, which have four colors in one. If you pour that ink out into a gallon jug, each color, it comes out to be about $5,000 a gallon. They make their money by selling the ink. They give you the printers cheap. They really are very complex machines. They sell it for very reasonable prices because they're making the money on the ink. Um, so anyway, you, you, this is basically how it works. And you can see this, this printer over here. This is the actual printer. You can see the ink cartridges. And then it's got the paper handling equipment. And built inside there is a computer. Now, all of this is, uh, we'll, we'll call this basically the, we'll, we'll, this, is, this is connected to all the paper handling stuff. You've got the ink, the ink jets, the paper handling equipment, and a controller. And all of this is in one case. And this is what we call, you know, a, a digital printer. There's, there's some right there, there's one right over there. Th these are the basic uh, constituents. Now, you have your PC over here. And what you have to, what you install in the PC is called a printer driver. A printer driver is a piece of software. It's going to tell, it connects to this. The printer driver tells the printer, tells the jet controller here, when and how often the various ink jets should uh, fire. And when you buy a printer for Epson, for example, and you, you install your printer driver, when you can print, you'll know, see, you'll say, for example, what kind of paper, you know, do you want, are you, are you using typewriter paper? Are you using glossy photo paper, or you use a matte photo paper. Each one of these uh, pieces, these uh, requirements 
are different because if you're if you're dropping ink onto a very soft piece of paper, it spreads, so you have to use a lot less. If you're printing on glossy, the ink has to be put down more heavily. Different glossy papers require more or less ink. So what? So inside this printer driver is something called a profile. I'll call it a paper profile. printer from Epson, it has built in these profiles for its own papers. So if you buy an Epson printer, you use Epson ink, you use Epson paper, you're going to get good results. But if you change papers, like I do, like this is this is a Red River paper, which is a lot cheaper than Epson paper, but gives equally good results. If I put Epson, if I put that paper in this printer, but use the Epson drivers, I'm not going to get good results. Sometimes you will, mostly not. So therefore, you have to change the profile, and these drivers don't let you change the profile. So programs like Photoshop, and there are others. built-in printer drivers. And what they allow you to do is put in a paper profile and then and then Photoshop takes over controlling the printer. And that's how all these these prints are done. Because I'm not using I'm not using Epson A, I'm not using Epson paper. So I have to download from the paper manufacturer for my printer, for the ink I'm using, and for the paper I'm using, a special direction to make this printer do what it has to do. And that's a rather important little detail because, um, and then the last thing I'd like to talk about is ink here. There are two kinds of ink. There's dye ink, and then there's um, pigment ink. Most printers you buy have dye ink because it's, it's thinner, it's easier uh, to put down, and it can get very beautiful colors, but they fade. I've had pictures that I printed with a dye printer and put it on my refrigerator, and a month or two later, it begin turning yellow a little bit. Now, they're getting better. But dye ink is not as, as good as pigment ink. And if you go to a gallery, you'll see they all, nowadays, almost every gallery has listed under its pictures archival pigment ink. Archival pigment ink. I've had uh, it's fairly recent. I've had a picture that I printed four years ago, pretty much in bright sunshine, and it's still straight. And as a matter of fact, I'll, so would that be the ink that you use for Cibachrome? Well, Cibachrome is uh, is a, pro, a process used for for standard photography, and. This is a high gloss one you've done, and that's a matte one over there. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these pictures here, and one of the things that my wife and I do, we print cards. These are all done with archival pigment ink, and you can have these out for long periods of time, they will not fade, and uh, the brilliant colors. If you're interested, I'll just leave you look at it. But archival pigment ink printers, which this is one, and these are, these over here are also archival pigment ink, um, are more difficult to maintain. 
And because the ink is thicker and it pods in the tiny carpet, the tiny hole with the little ink jets. So printers like this one clean themselves every day. They, they, they keep squirting the ink to keep it moist. Around here, everything's dry. I have to, for my printer, I have to keep a, cool, a little container of water right inside of it to keep it humid. Otherwise, at the end of each, I didn't bring in an ink jet, but ink jets are just, just a little plate with zillions of little holes. And that's where the ink comes through. And if the ink dries in those holes, it doesn't come through. You so you keep water in your I keep water. Now, with dye printers, it's not as critical. But with pigment ink printers here, you have to keep, keep it somewhat humid so the ink doesn't dry out. Or, when I called Epson about it, they said, well, just, uh, just have a babysitter, turn it on every day. Every day you turn on the printer, it squirts a little ink through the jets and uh, it keeps the moist. Every printer has what's called a diaper above. In the model of your printer is a, is a piece of, of a material that the excess ink used to clean drops into the diaper. And I figure for me about 20% of the ink I use goes into the diaper. Because just keeping the, the ink just pours over. So if you ever get into printing yourself, especially with archival pigment inks, you have to consider whether or not you have the patience to stick with the cleaning of the jets if it doesn't need it. And the one way to get around it is that I buy all my inks second party inks. I took courses in the community college inks. And so I fill my own cartridges. But there are a lot of different inks out there and some are so much better than others. But I found one through my instructor that is so close to Epson inks that it's just a fraction of the cost. So that's another option if you ever get it. So, and printers also have this distinguishing thing. You, like my printer will print this size card. Many printers still require uh, print much larger. You can't print this small. Many printers leave a half inch edge on one side so that the printer can grab the paper and pull it in. The printer I have doesn't need that. So there are a lot of features, just like with the cameras, that the printing companies distinguish themselves between one another. Some, some can print edge to edge, others don't, can't do it. Some can print with rolls, I can print on canvas. This is a, these are canvas prints, this one's canvas. I can print on all kinds of, you know, glossy papers. So anyway, I think I may have run, what time was it? Class in, Stephen? As it moved, it was 10.30 now. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, well, then we have plenty of time for questions. So, would anyone like to talk about what is the subjects? So you have to ask some questions? I have to ask some questions. I don't think it's necessarily the best printer. I mean, Canon makes some new printers. Um, it just so happens that my philosophy is if I want to learn something, I try and find somebody who's already doing it and then ask them for guidance. And I've done that with printing. I found somebody who made a living producing prints for artists. She used an Epson printer. She used Epson eggs. She used the new eggs that I'm using. She showed me how to fill cartridges. That's what I know. It works for me. So that's one of the things I would highly recommend as you go into this, if you, if you want to go deeper, whether it's photography or whether it's printing. See if you can find a mentor. If you like the work that he or she is doing, buy the same camera. Because all, all of this is so complex that it just takes a lot of time to learn it yourself. Any other questions for Richard?
by the way, since you're here, I'll just mention one thing. One thing that I've done for the last five or six years is digitize everything. I have a Fujitsu digitizer, which I can just take a piece of paper, like when, when a bill comes into my, on my desk, I look at it, I drop it in the slot, press a button, and it goes zip, and it's done. That's how it is. And I see the never sale of Fujitsu and Meat has some, but these, these digitizers are amazing and they do a very good job with color pictures. So for example, if you have a, lots of snapshots, you know, boxes from the snapshots, and you want to quickly digitize them, using these things it slows the glasses. I have one of these, I did I never use them. But these, these uh, cheap feeding uh, digitizers, Allow me to just take a little picture and drop it in. You press a button to change whether you want high resolution or low resolution. You, know. you just drop it in and it just zoom, 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 and one picture is done. And, and the quality is just amazing. You can save it as a JPEG, save it as a PDF, and you know, you know, it So if you were archiving a lot of stuff, these, these, this is the slow way to go. How about if you're Four by five negatives. Four by five negatives. Is that what we're yes. going to do in the collection right now? Yeah. Yeah. We're using that, and it takes it for a fact. It just zero. Yeah. Well. And then we have to process it in the light room. Yeah. After we. Some, some digitizing machines have automatic feeders. They stack them all up and let it run all night. Mm -hmm. um, these are, these are I master. Are these photographs? Yeah, they're, they're photographs. Transparencies, which are sort of halfway in between, right? Yeah. And I discovered that with the proper lighting, that it would have light, using a solid copy attachment for the camera worked very well. And I don't know if it would work well for that. Probably not, because some of these images will be used for catalogs. We're going up to big banner poster sizes. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Exactly. So I think I think we're just going to have to live with, with slowness. I'm just trying to find a way to make it easier. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I know I'm going to have to do it again. Yeah. 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 Thank you.